Electric utilities around the world are preparing for the electrification of transportation. It's a big deal. And the in Canada, uh, Qtric is uh, uh, the Canadian Urban Transportation Research and Innovation uh, Investment Consortium has put out a, a big report on how utilities in Canada can drive electrification of transportation. So I'm going to talk to Dr. Jospa Petrunic about that. So welcome to the interview, Jospa. Thank you so much for having me, Markham. Look, why don't we start with an overview of your study, please? Yeah, another massive study, uh, but they're kind of deep in the weeds studies that we love to do. This is a report that started actually a couple years ago. The whole intention was to figure out what are utilities in Canada doing when it comes to transit electrification? Are they helping? Are they hindering? Are they just doing nothing? That was the premise of it. So what we did was a whole scan across Canada, almost every public utility in this country that produces and sells electricity to figure out, are they doing anything? And the answer to that question is very few are doing anything strategic to help transit electrification. There are a couple good case studies and there's no doubt that the leader is BC Hydro for best practices, but Canada's utility sector is years behind what California has done. And we're years behind where we need to be to get to our zero emissions goal for the climate. Well, let's talk about the good stuff first. Can you tell us what BC Hydro is doing? Yeah, there's lots of good examples. Um, the challenge with the good examples are they are almost siloed case studies that you can look to, and that's why they're so unique. They're siloed case studies. They should be the norm. So BC Hydro and Hydro-Quebec are leaders in this country in thinking about this. BC Hydro in particular, because what they have done is they have worked hand in hand with the province of British Columbia. So this is the most important thing to note. You will often hear people saying utilities should do more. They should do more. Yeah, but utilities are structured around a regulatory framework. There's a regulator. And that regulator will only let them do business in areas that the province says they're allowed to work in. And most provinces in this country have not had ministers of energy that have come out and said climate action is important. And so you can use the electricity system to solve the climate problem. Only in British Columbia has that actually happened in the rate. So in British Columbia, the government has passed legislation that has said the, tr uh, the utility can in fact get involved in owning, operating, charging systems for public transit. But more importantly, they've created a piece of legislative uh, ruling that allows the regulator to say, BC Hydro can actually create new electricity rates. So BC Hydro has created two new rates, an overnight rate and a demand transition rate, which are basically technical terms for, for TransLink and BC Transit in the province, they now can charge up overnight and not be charged these really expensive demand charges that are cutting into the cost savings of electric buses. And for the first six years um, of the program, they won't be charged any demand charges when the buses charge up at high power en route. That is a huge cost savings to TransLink and BC Transit. And that gives them enough time to get the first buses out the door, figure out what they're doing, figure out how the buses are working, and then figure out how they demand manage, how they manage their charging schedule to get to the lowest possible cost. Uh, that is what BC Hydro has done, but they have done it because the province has said they can do it. And that's the critical uniqueness. Now, uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, US jurisdictions, including California. And of course, down there, they have a very different structure. It's much more market-based and the utilities uh, are down there are uh, adjusting to uh, the switch to uh, renewables and, and intermittent uh, power. And mm -hmm. they're, they're basically rethinking their business model and they're much more aggressive about this issue of where can I find new demand? How can I lock in like transit authorities into my market so I, you know, I can invest in these new sources of generation? So we look up in Canada, of course, most of Canadian utilities are owned by the government. The provincial yep. provincial government and that seems to me to be a structural impediment to what you're talking about because now we're relying on politicians and if it's well, not on a political agenda then mm -hmm. they're not going to give their crown corporation the direction and support that it that re requires 
Right. I'm actually going to uh, underpin what you just said, because I understand how on the face of it, that's what it looks like. But let's look at the Californian example. In fact, it has everything to do with politics. So although they have these aggressive utilities looking at renewable energy, if you take a look at the utilities across California, um, the six utilities that are really fundamentally relevant to the Californian landscape, they also were trying to do things around electric vehicle charging in the mid 2010s. And they also were more or less stopped by their regulator. And the reason is because the regulator of electricity, whether it's in California or Ontario or Alberta or British Columbia, they have one job. Their job is to make sure that poor people, poor people and all people can afford electricity because it's an essential service. So ultimately, it means that the regulator's job is to figure out if, and I've used this example before, if the single mom in downtown Calgary, let's say, on a low income is paying an exorbitant rate for her electricity because some guy has a Tesla and wants access to an electric charger that the utility owns and operates. So the regulator's job is to make sure that electricity prices don't include all these exorbitant costs that privilege richer people or non-utility customers, but that they do equalize across customers. And so in reality, California is in the exact same situation. What's different in California is that in 2015, the state through legislation passed Senate Bill 350. And what did that do? That was the state saying climate action is a serious problem. We are going to change what we think equitable electricity pricing is. So now we do think it's okay for people, even poor people, to pay potentially a little bit higher in electricity prices if it means that utilities can co-invest in transit electrification because the net benefit to society outweighs the cost to the people paying for the electricity. That piece of legislation turned around the situation and it is now requiring utilities in California to have a transit electrification program. They can no longer sit by passively. We have nothing to compare in Canada. No legislature has taken similar action. It, my takeaway from that conversation, uh, you know, is that we're still reliant upon pol uh, provincial governments and the politicians who lead them to, to get on, on board. And uh, if they haven't to date, what are the likelihood that they will in the future? And, you know, is QTRC, for example, going to be lobbying provincial governments to change their approach on this? Uh, so the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Uh, the first thing is we do have a problem uh, across 10 provinces and three territories. We have a lot of provinces that have declared climate a real problem, climate action, a real emergency. And yet none of our ministries of energy, except for those in British Columbia and Quebec, have actually integrated the utility market as part of the climate action solution. In fact, we have a number of premiers who have declared that reducing the cost of electricity is critical. We can all agree that expensive electricity is a problem for humanity, there's no doubt, but re requiring utilities to not be able to get involved in the electrification landscape for transit is a fundamental problem. So there's no doubt we're gonna be involved sharing our report with ministries of energy and ministries of transportation so they can understand how deploying electric buses is really dependent on the energy sector starting to reconsider what fair electricity pricing actually is. That's true. But the second thing is there is a private sector in this market. Uh, there is a private sector. And one of the case studies we look at is Ontario power generation. And many utilities in Ontario have non-regulated affiliate wins, private business wins, consulting wins. And that OPG kind of consulting business has gotten involved in helping Toronto Transit Commission design its electrification agenda and figuring out how they're going to deploy their buses in the lowest possible cost using smart charging with Toronto Hydro as a partner. That's a workable solution, but it's a cost recovery model, right? It's a model where TTC is going to pay for a portion of that, like they would with any private business. And OPG to get into the business is going to absorb some of the losses to create a business wing for themselves. But when the private sector is involved, well, then somebody's got to pay for that cost. And that means transit and transit riders. So the ultimate issue here, Markham, I will say is, is it transit and transit riders only? that pay for all the costs of electrification? Or is it that electricity rate payers can share the burden of that cost? And right now what we're saying is it is fair given the crisis we are in that both transit riders and electricity rate payers, and I would throw in their car drivers who should be priced per road kilometer and some of that money should go into transit electrification, all three should be paying the price of getting to zero emissions public transit. That's not the situation today, but that is most certainly what we will be lobbying for. 
Well, over and over again, Yospa, uh, when I interview experts in other countries, uh, I'm, they make the point that uh, policy is absolutely critical uh, to the energy transition, in this case, the electrification of transportation, uh, because policy can, a uh, good, well-designed policy can uh, spur cost-effective advances in the industry. Poorly designed or no policy can inhibit uh, the industry from moving forward. And it looks like in Canada, we still, you know, are at the stage where it's either with a couple of exceptions, poor policy or no policy. And that comes back to politics and, and narrative. We have to start talking about this issue. And I gather that's probably one of the reasons you or one of the objectives you had with your study is to start that conversation. Absolutely. And I would also say, I'll add another element, like we can point our finger to politicians and there's no doubt if you have an ideologue that's going to put up barriers to climate action, that is a full stop to the public service doing anything. Even though if you have an ideologue on the other side, an extreme environmentalist who tries to do everything, they're also not going to be 100% successful because there's another factor consider here. There are public services. We have very large bureaucracies that do a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to good public policy. And it's a two-way street in Canada. It's not like it's just politicians telling bureaucrats what to do. Bureaucrats who are senior and expert can and often do advise government leaders on what to do as well. It's a two-way street if it's in fact an open dialogue. Um, but we do have a challenge that we don't have a very large class of public servants in Canada at the provincial levels. At the federal level, I think we have a good grouping of people who have expertise in this area. The government's recruited people. But when you go west to east in this country, in the provincial public servant uh, category, we don't actually have that many people in public service, certainly not at senior or mid-level areas where they've worked in this industry, they've cut their teeth on this industry, they have private sector experience in this industry, and then they've gone to public service. It is very thin. And so how much great involved public um, policy can we get when we don't have a huge cadre of, I don't want to say intelligentsia, that's not the right word, it's more technocrats who have that technical industry experience. That is something I think we need to focus on as Canadians, building up our public service and building up the smarts and the brains in the public service in the sector. Not that people aren't smart, they are, but not in this sector. It's just, we don't have the skills in this sector in our own governments. So even if you've got the environmentalist ideologue politician, they're gonna hit a full stop with uh, public servants who don't necessarily have the skill to deliver on these policies the way we need. That is a block for Canada. Because if I do look to our European colleagues, you'll take a look at public servants, very often public servants, especially at the senior levels in Germany and Austria, in France, in Britain, they have decades of experience outside of the public sector before they are at senior levels of decision making. We don't typically have that in Canada. And I do think that that is a challenge in this great transition. Well, that's uh, all fascinating, uh, uh, Jospa, and, and, and reinforced by a lot of the interviews I've done in other countries about this uh, and, and policy issues in general around the energy transition. So uh, good luck with your uh, study, uh, educa educating uh, governments uh, from uh, coast to coast to coast. And I'll check in with you uh, in the future, maybe in the new year, and see what kind of progress you've made. Thanks for, uh, for your insights. Thanks so much, Markham.